Hello. So it's so nice to be here at Slush. It's my first time, but it's been a great event so far. Uh, I'm Osa. I'm the CEO at Pitch. And uh, today I'm going to be walking you through a playbook of how to build uh, winning go-to-market teams. And uh, at Pitch, we really believe in the power of visual communication. We believe that there's uh, much more delightful ways of creating presentations than you can do today. And therefore, we're building a product that should make it very easy and very, like a ni very nice experience to create a deck like, like this. And uh, there's so many important decisions made each day, which are really based on how, how the information is communicated to take them. So presentations as a medium to share knowledge or present ideas is really the way forward. So before I go into this presentation, I'll tell you just super short about me. As a COO at Pitch, I'm in charge of uh, building up the organization and thinking about how we work cross-functionally, as well as driving our company strategy. I've, uh, I'm, I actually have a background in engineering and product. I worked, uh, as they said, in Spotify and Natural Cycles, in different engineering, release management and leadership positions. And um, um, I really have a passion, actually, for thinking about how do you drive collaboration across departments, across projects or companies, and uh, how you really can develop that. I, we created this uh, presentation, uh, me and my colleague Nick, he is the president at Pitch. He has more than 20 years of experience of building sales and go-to-market teams, and uh, we, uh, we um, really sat down and thought about like, how can we give you a playbook for, uh, for, with best practices for creating winning go-to-market teams. And uh, that is what I'm going to dive into now. But first, it's, we believe it's really time for a new playbook. The recent years has shown us that um, old practices as team building in the office and uh, a lot of face-to-face -face meetings are, um, are being questioned. And we've, I mean, in all honesty, we haven't been able to do it due to the pandemic. Remote, uh, remote is a new norm for some companies, but we're also seeing a lot of companies going back to the, to the office. And um, we think that, or like one theme actually in this conference, what, we, what I've heard a lot about is that more and more companies talking about going back, back to the office. And there is this debate, should it be hybrid teams, should it be office, should it be re fully remote? But I think in the end, the question that we really need to ask ourselves is kind of how do we empower teams to work regardless? So I'm uh, going to go through seven practices. And we hope that these are practices that you can take back with you and uh, look at your organization or your company and see if this is something that you want to apply or want to challenge your current way of working with. First, a little bit about hiring. So, hiring for discovery. Then I'm going to go into self-guided onboarding and how to, how to create an onboarding flow that is, that is uh, adapted to different learning styles. We're going to talk about developing a collaborative strategy and goals, having a commitment to tools for go-to-market teams and a process-oriented approach, how you can work with product and how you can really make sure to align to get the best results. We are also going to talk about how to um, use team rituals to really enhance the culture you want to build. And uh, last but not least, navigating by principle. And we think all of these uh, address different challenges that all of us face when we're building up our go-to-market go -to -market teams. So first, hire for discovery. So when you launch a product, it's a major, major milestone for every founder or every person who's been in a new, in a new company. And uh, while this is an amazing and fun experience, there's also a lot of pressure involved. 
you, uh, you want to launch a product, you want to see how it's received by the customers, you have investors to think about, and, uh, and, uh, but maybe most of all you have your own pressure on, uh, or your own expectations on yourself that can be quite intense. And um, I've both seen and talked with several startup founders where at this point you hardly breathe until you say, and now I have to build up my go-to-market team. Here, uh, our recommendation is to actually just take some time and take that pause. Think about who is it that we really need to get into our team and who do we need to get to be part of building up the company at this stage. And um, Nick and I talked about two traps that, is, that are super easy to fall into when you think about building up your go-to-market team. One is to hire a deal closer. You know, that kind of amazing person that can convince you to buy anything can have a great track record of, of closing deals and uh, selling products. And of course, this is a person you always want to have in the company. But is it the right one in the beginning? The second one is to hire an, a networker, a person who in an event like this knows everyone and can really just serve you with dozens and dozens of leads of potential customers. But you also have to have the capacity to take care of those leads. So what we talked about instead is to hire for discovery, really trying to find people with the qualities of the two above, but a person who is really uh, have an open-minded learner mindset, who is maybe more, more interested in talking to the customer and understanding their problems and before they start to suggest solutions and someone who's really strong at taking those insights from the customer and bring them back to the product team or to the leadership team and see how, how they can be used to, to further deepen your product market fit. So I think, I mean, you're, I won't tell you who to hire because your go-to-market team will depend so much about what project, if it's a B2, or what product you have. If it's a B2B, B2C, if it's going, you know, the customer are enterprises or individuals, and that has to guide the profile. But what you should look for is a person with a discovery, open-minded learning mindset. So, you're starting to hire up your team. How do you onboard them? I mean, at, I think many of us here has been at boot camps, uh, previous jobs or previous companies. They're super fun. It can be one or two weeks where you have a lot of information sharing, a lot of networking events. It's a little bit like being in this kind of conference. It's extremely fun. It can also be a bit overwhelming and sometimes it's hard to know what did I actually learn. It was meeting the people that was the important part. So at Pitch, we're remote first, so we really focused on actually showing that or... I mean, we hire intentionally remote people who want to work remote. And we're building up our processes equally. And when our go-to-market... Like, when our, our, our people in the go-to-market team join, we really set them up for a self-guided onboarding. And we do that by making sure we document our strategy, our ways of working, and all of these things that normally people just present to you in an onboarding boot camp in a way so they can consume it asynchronously. We use Notion for long-form content. We use Pitch with recordings for content that is more uh, benefits from visual, on, visual communication. And we use Slack and a very intentional way of using slash, Slack. <laughs> To, um, to make sure that they know where to ask questions and how to be guided further. And it's not that we underestimate the value of FaceTime. It's, it's wonderful to meet people, but when we do that, since we are distributed, we make it very intentional. So when we set up a Zoom meeting or an onboarding call, we focus on, on meeting and exchanging uh, meaningful uh, meaningful conversations, instead of just me presenting the company strategy to the team. That they can do in their own time, 
depending on which time zone they are in, when it suits them during the day, and how intense they want this process to be. So then, how about setting strategy? So it's not uncommon that top, uh, that leaders, that setting strategy and setting goals is a very top-down, uh, top-down way, and or it's done top-down. And uh, it's not uncommon that the the CFO or chief revenue officer sets these goals and then push them down the organization. Maybe get them signed off by the board first, and then they ask, that, then they ask the go-to-market teams to deliver on it. And if you compare product and engineering teams with go-to-market, I would say that go-to-market teams, it's so easy to monitor the results. So it's very tempting to just set them and just ask, like, hit these targets. Whereas in product and engineering, it's always been the harder part of saying, kind of trying to quantify this. Pros and cons with both. both. But we really believe in that if you do this together with your team, there is the likelihood of the results being good is so much higher. So I'm just going to share a story that Nick told me. He was head of EMEA for CircleCI, a US-based business, super successful, but that was going to scale up in Europe. And the way he did this was that he, he really started to hire local, a local team, of course. Local sales representatives, customer support, that knew local, local patterns and, um, and the, the, the way that customers use the product. And he really focused on building trust within the team before moving on, making them collaborate, making sure that they actually exchanged all the knowledge they had about the space before setting the strategy and before committing to goals. And, um, they could leverage what had worked with a US sales strategy, but then really think about EMEA and Europe, it's a different region. We, customers have different, different demands and different ways of working, and uh, they could adapt it and evolve it to, to these needs, set the goals together, and it became super successful. So they grew from 7% to 25% of company revenue in less than three years. Okay, so tools. Doesn't sound super fun, but it is really, really valuable. So productivity, efficiency, and creativity, things we all use in all kinds of uh, different discussion forums. What we really think is important here is to have a process-oriented approach when you set up your go-to-market team. Think about from when the user hears about your brand at the first instance, to they become a returning user, hopefully a paying user. And, uh, and as an example, top performing sales professionals are twice as likely to use tools in their sales process than underperforming counterparts. So there's something magic if you get your tools right. And um, um, what, you really, what you really want to do here is to look at the whole stack and see or, or look out for maybe two things. One is, in this process that you're running, where are there many manual, or where is there a lot of manual work? And the other thing, like during this process, where, where do you have like too little insights to really have an impactful result? When it comes to the manual work, there's quite a lot of tools out there already, like signing tools or... Um, or transcript, uh, transcript tools, call transcript tools, that can really help you to get the very boring, time-consuming manual work done. And uh, when you talk about, for example, life cycle marketing, marketing, there's a lot of tools that can really help you to make sure that you give the customer the right message at the right time. And um, for those, um, I mean, so, Tools is actually also a really good way of avoiding having to build up a big team to try to keep it very lean and to try to not 
make sure that you have a big organization that also gets very vulnerable. And, um, and I think in the end, when you, look at your, when you look at your tool stack, it is, or when you look at what you would like to have, it is important to not think that you have to build everything at the same time. At pitch, it's still not, it's, it's not ideal in any way, but we have mapped out what we would like to have and how it should work together, so we don't put ourselves into a corner for a certain, for a certain thing. And last, for those of you who already built companies with go-to-market tools and so on, it's easy to think that what worked five years ago is still the best solution. There's been an immense uh, development within tools for marketing in the last years. So our advice there is really to don't shy away of, of looking up new and upcoming tools that can give you much better insights than the tools that we had some years ago. So pairing up with product, maybe my, my, uh, uh, what's dearest to my heart in this? So I think there's so much value if you get your go-to-market teams to pair up with your product teams. A close connection between the two is just a winning concept of staying efficient. I've been in several companies where sales or customer supports either wanted to give wanted us to build features for, uh, for making their deal go through or to promise features because the, the, they were asking for it from the customer support team or success team. And it often came back as a very urgent request to product. And maybe then you just built like not the most pragmatic solution, not the most innovative solution. And in worst case, you built things that actually made your product strategy diverge, diverge. So I'm going to tell a story about Spotify when I was there and how we worked with it. So we were building a new client, or a new Spotify client on a big platform. And this entailed uh, all departments, more or less. We had legal involved, business development, sales, marketing, engineering, and so on. And I was thinking early on, how can we make sure that the decisions we take now and in these different groups are the best for the end result? So, to do that, I mean, trust, I talked about it a lot, but trust is a key, key ingredient. And um, uh, so I did set up a, a Friday lunch meeting where I asked the, the sales representative, the le head of legal, and uh, the marketing representative, product and engineering, to sit around the table and just give an update. What are you working on and what is kind of blocking you or what is challenging for you right now? And... Uh, to be honest, in the beginning, it was quite awkward. You had a sales guy there who really didn't want to be in that, on that table. You had product and engineering that thought that, I'm doing this, I've done this scrum of scrums a million times, why is this useful again? But I insisted that we try it out, also to kind of bridge, these, bridge the knowledge and the trust between. And after a while, you started to see these great things happen. So suddenly, the guy from legal brought up, well, you know, they want this into the contract. Is this an easy thing to do, or, or is it a hard thing to do? And within five minutes, you got that product feedback. Actually, this is easy. This is part of our product strategy. Put it in the contract, that's great. Or it could be, hey, this, this thing over here, it's super hard to build. It's much more complex than it seems. Let's try to get that out of the contract. And in the end, I think that for me, the, the magic moment was super late in the project where the product team had this really hard deadline and they had to prioritize their backlog. And you know how that goes. It is painful and it's, people don't want to do it. But what they did then was actually to turn to the marketing team and say, hey, out of these things, from your point of view, what is most important? And that marketing team said, well, this kind of sign-up flow would would be amazing. This is what we actually need to get our, our product launch become successful from a marketing perspective, an acquisition perspective. And, and in the end, that was probably one of the, the best uh, decisions we took because that really generated great, great results. So, including everyone in team rituals. 
I mean, I think there's been a lot of talking uh, in this um, uh, at, at Slash here about culture and what that means. And culture is communication, collaboration, decision making, and how you interact with each other at, at job. What I want to talk about is how team rituals can help you to really enhance the culture that you want to build. For example, inclusiveness. I worked with this for many years. It's so much easier said than done. And Everyone wants it, but how do you actually make it happen? And we have a super, super small thing that we do um, that, that is one example of how small things could actually mean a lot to many people. So we have our quarterly plannings. We do them quarterly, as, as it says. And uh, we gather a lot of people from different teams that may or may not know each other and have this bigger, bigger group coming together. And we actually start that, start that quarterly planning with asking all of them to avoid abbreviations, avoid sarcasm, don't tell, in, like avoiding internal jokes, and try to speak with an easy language. I mean, we're all from different countries. I'm not a native English speaker. Most of my colleagues aren't either. And uh, while this can seem boring, and this can seem like, oh, but what's the joy? It is actually one of the, the most efficient, way, efficient ways to, to make sure that people don't stay quiet, don't stay silent, because that's what happens when it becomes too much internal. When you don't understand what's going on in the room, you'd rather stay quiet, even unconsciously, to, not, to know that you're not doing something wrong. And for me, the, the goal with these sessions is that we have an outcome where we get all the people's knowledge and thoughts onto the table and can really question the strategy, our go-to-market strategy or product strategy moving forward. There's another thing that is also uh, important, and that is about how you celebrate success. So it's easy now in Slack that you get these automatic sales updates. So we close the deal and you see this kind of automation of, of um, updates coming in. But it's even more important to actually celebrate together. So how do you do that in a remote setting or if you're in the office but have remote sales teams? So at Pitch we have something that we call the Team Bulletin. It actually started with one of our developers when we were just, still just 20 people who said, I'm never creating a presentation. How can I dog food our product? And he came up with this concept of a team bulletin, a Friday afternoon show and tell. And we still keep it. It's been live for now four or three, four years. And every Friday afternoon, teams add some slides, a couple of slides with just some uh, talking about or showing what they've been building, maybe adding some new experiments, showing off that they succeeded or sold something. And um, it's just a way of being proud of what you did that week. It's not about reporting on OKRs or KPIs or anything like that. It's just a way of celebrating in a synchronous way what we achieve together. And I personally start each Monday morning with a coffee and going through the team bulletin. And it, it actually gives so much energy going into the week when you see what the whole company has been working on. So sticking to principles. So another theme, of course, this time at Slush has been the tough financial environment. It's, uh, we're in it, and we all have to react, we have to pivot, we have to make some painful changes, and do some decision-making that is not the, the, the decision-making of the fun sort. And, uh, and we have to do it quite quickly to make sure that we actually emerge from this as a health, healthy business. And, um, this is the time where you can really lean on your values and your principles. And I think for us, we've also had, kind of had, had to take some difficult decisions this, this fall. And uh, what we could see here is kind of we really let first principles guide us in the decision making. What do we need to do? What is really crucial for our business? And we could lean on that and align. 
And then you come to the tricky part, kind of how do we do this? And that is when your values really play a part. And we're, we're eight founders at, at uh, Pitch. I'm not one of them, but there's eight founders and there's four more in the leadership team. It's a quite big group. Of course, we, we don't on a daily basis work together, but in these moments, it's super crucial for us that we all stand behind the decision we were making and the way we're doing it. And this is really when your values and using first principles matters. I think also like we, we have this opportunity now to really dig into are we working towards the right mission? Is our strategy bold enough? Are we going to use new channels? And here is really an opportunity for teams to, to think out of the box and really try to challenge the status quo. And the plans you made up one year ago, you just have to redo them. So, last but not least, when the going gets tough, go to market. And I think this is, uh, this is just a good opportunity to, to really point out that while it's tough, it can also be super, super fun. And it can also be the moment where you have the chance to really excel. And first of all, like, there's a lot of appetite out there for, for having companies solving problems. I don't know if you saw uh, Sanna Marin yesterday on the stage, but she, I mean, she really, really asked for us all to continue to focus to problem solving. Then there's a lot of investors. We've had several investors um, announcing new funds in the recent days. There's definitely money out there. So there's still great opportunities to get your business backed by investors. And then I think, I mean, all of us are still looking for new tools, new way of consuming things, and the consumer appetite for tech products is still really, really big. So what we really hope is that you yeah, see this moment as a, as a possibility to also challenge and uh, make sure that you go to market with a good strategy that you believe in and that you think can work. And um, yeah, that was, that was what I had. I hope this, these practices can help you. I hope you can get some, uh, some uh, good advice from it and uh, that you can really see how that can work for your teams or not work for your teams. It's totally up to you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm Osa, try pitch, and uh, thanks for having me.